Hello, or hi friends, this seems to be the theme <laughs> this season, and welcome to Is This Really For Kids, a podcast where I, your host, Leah Touchton, decide, is children's media really for children? And I'm qualified to do that because I'm a mental health advocate who has covered from their slew of own mental health problems, and... I also am a filmmaker, so I know what it takes to make a film. I'm working on making some big ones for teenagers myself. And I also just like to have fun and talk about movies, and it gives more movies more press. And even if it's a bad movie, I I leave it to you to check it out yourself. Uh, Today, I am very, very excited to talk about this one. Uh, I just did it by myself because I don't think a lot of people know about it yet, and I feel like they should because it's genius. I mean, some people who are Star Kid Potter fans are absolutely going to know about this musical. It's probably one of my favorites might be my favorite I don't know Heather's is really good though um but I'll have to rewatch the movie and double check to make sure that I stand by that but this musical is like up there maybe close second I mean it's just it's so amazing I would love to be a part of it I would love to direct it I would love to do something with this musical I just think it's genius and da 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 I will tell you it now it is Black Friday uh I might release this episode earlier ideally I would have this would have been an episode I ended on and maybe that will still be the case but I'm gonna try to see if I can find some guesties and yeah I am super excited to talk about this movie musical thing you actually can watch this completely for free on the UE2 but you just go to Star Kid Potter and then you'll go to Black Friday the musical that's one of the most recent ones that they have done and oh I love it so much I think it's incredible just want to just keep saying that so basically it starts off with that they are selling this absolutely terrifying toy that I don't know why anyone buy it but who knows people bought Cabbage Patch Kids but they were kind of cute I still think but anyway yeah this is definitely a, a lot scarier than Cabbage Patch Kid or Raggedy Ann doll which are there's so many that are possessed in New Orleans and that definitely messed me up on the way that I'll see Raggedy Ann forever but they do this sort of like commercial infomercial type sketch of you know a Tickle Me Wiggly who is a creature out of this world and sleeps the dreamless sleep of the dead I I, I wasn't sold especially that it's $50 for that ugly doll and then we go to Paul and Emma who are driving to go see Emma's brother, Tom. Paul hates that, the, like, advertising of the commercial, uh, because he doesn't like musicals, which is also one of their other musicals that they have, is the guy who doesn't like musicals. That's just, like, a thing that they they do, so they do a callback to that. Uh, I don't know enough about that one to review it quite yet or say my commentary on how I feel about the callback but I like appreciated it but that's also like Star Kids thing is very tongue-in-cheek and and being meta and, and doing whatever they want because they're indie and they can and it's honestly awesome so they hate Black Friday there's all of these riots over these wigglies and there were riots over Cabbage Patch toys which is pretty wild and they make this joke of like I wanted a salad with the Cabbage Patch toy, but now I have a child. And they feel like, you know, this mania is just like a spell, weirdly. And then they're going to go see Emma's brother-in-law, Tom. And her brother-in-law lost his wife, Emma's sister, in a car crash that was last year. Her brother-in-law, who lost his wife, is an asshole. Maybe understandably, but still an asshole. But they're the only family that he has left. He is immediately mad at Emma that she is late because she said 6, but it's 6.30. And she was like, well, she had to get a Starbucks. So Tom springs it on Emma that she needs to watch Tim and so she's like kind of shocked because she didn't think she was babysitting but he reveals that he is only gonna be gone for a few hours but Emma really wanted a family get together so Emma's all upset you know because she thought there was gonna be a get together and she like brought her partner Paul they're not really dating well they're dating but they they haven't put a label on it and Tim admits to Paul that his dad gets flashbacks he just remembers bad things vividly 
But the reason Tom is going to be gone for only a couple hours is that he lies to Tim and says that he needs a new blade for his bland saw, but he is trying to cover up the fact that he's trying to get him a Tickle Me Wiggly Gall as a Christmas gift. And they kind of just break the news to Tom that, you know, if he wanted that, he should have been in line last night because there's just, like, a huge line waiting for them. And now he feels like a very bad father and sings one of my favorite musical theater songs ever. It's just full of emotional depth. So beautiful. What Tim wants. I also love the joke where Tom is like, he did two tours in Iraq, but he didn't do it for, and they, like, thank him for his service. And he's like, I didn't do it for you, which is, I feel like, very much such a military joke that I've heard made and it's it's very funny honestly because it's weird you can serve your country but not serve everybody in your country welcome to America welcome to it I do really like the intensity of the sun like it's the young woman who plays the children in this is just honestly very very good and just very compelling she brings this intensity towards Tim that I just really like just yeah really really good job already off to a great start always good but just there's really something really well crafted about this musical and it's such an original it's not really it's like spoofing off of things but but it's its own thing you know which is most of them but they're also like really having relying that you know like the genre to a degree anyway so tom pulls up and sees his former favorite student which maybe it's messed up to have a favorite student but i'm sure everybody does it because that's humanity and it is what it is and his favorite student lex is smoking a cigarette and Tom tries to park in the loading dock and she's like, oh yeah, you can park loading dock even though it says there's no parking at any time and she'll just tell the loading trucks to park across the street. And Tom is just kind of disappointed in Lex that she dropped out of high school and what she's doing with her life and she's smoking and Lex is like, I only did well in your class because it was shop class and you got an A if you just didn't chop off your fingers. And Tom is like, I'm not going to hold an accident like that against her. But she gets really mad that he left because he was her role model. And then she details like why she kind of dropped out in her high school downfall because he left due to that family emergency, which isn't really fair to him, you know, like he was... He literally had to go too. It was just kind of an, in, kind of that one thing where like a bad thing that affects somebody affects all the people who care about that somebody. Like that circle vortex, that circle of suffering that it just kind of extends because as humans we're all enmeshed and tied to each other. And then it is revealed that Lex has a job as a stock girl at Toy Zone, and Tom asked that Lex screw over hundreds of people, violate company policy. And give him a Tickle Me Wiggly doll, even though he, and he asks all of this, even though he just told Lex that she should be more responsible. So Lex is like, nope, sorry, you're gonna have to get in line like everybody else because she needs this job because she's saving for money. And he is just like, fine, let him tow the car. So he gets back in line. So Lex's boss, Frank Pricely, who I don't love when sings, but whatever, it's fine. He explains that Black Friday is that the time where the stores go from being in the red, losing money, to being in the black. Then the Wiggly commercial guy who's dropping off all the Wigglies says, oh, don't worry, you're going to go so far in the black, you're never going to come back, and that they are going to make a killing, and then hits on this teenage girl, Lexi, by saying, hello, naughty list, which is super nasty, nasty, nasty bad bad joey richter but he i love him he's so good at everything he does um him and lauren are so freaking cute i love it anyway (laughs) star kid obsession over here so then lex stuffs a wiggly doll into her backpack stealing it and when she does so ethan green yells that she is a shoplifter which scares her but Ethan is her boyfriend, so it's fine. It's just a good joke when she is dating this kind of bad boy dude. And her little sister doesn't really want to be there. And Lex asks, hey, is it a good day or a bad day? But Hannah says that it's a bad day. And she gives the Hannah the backpack to wear, but Hannah doesn't want to because she said she's really not supposed to because her webby which is this spider from outer space. Not crazy creative, but that told her to to not wear the backpack. Hint, hint, hint. 
honestly very very good setup and everything and then ethan gives hannah this hat that is imbued with the power of grayscale so nothing can help nothing can harm her while wearing it so hannah takes the hat and the backpack and ethan is like oh you'd be a really great dad which is so cringe to me when people say that even though like it's fine you should be able to brag better and like you should know if you're a good parent but it just seems so obtuse when men brag about themselves and he's such like an obnoxious bad boy and i have like a thing for like the said bad boy that just like it just really turns me off because i've just a lot of my abusers were bad boys so it's not fair to them because a bad boy is just being a bad boy, but I like a good boy now, you know? And I will say, Ethan is really good with the sister, but I don't like that he complains about her even though we solved it. And also wanted to go back to shout out this joke uh, when Emma and Paul were with Tim and they're like, oh, maybe we'll do the bumper cars. And then he's like, I don't like that because of his mom dying. It's just really funny. And Tim also admits that his dad can't even hold a gun. Like, he doesn't even like a fake one with everything i also want to shout another joke where i think lex is like well if i don't support my drinking habit who will which is just very silly just so many good lines in here as always there's always amazing things um the way that the wiggly la doll laughs is so so scary it is revealed that they're going to get seven thousand for the doll which is going to take them to California where Lex can be an actress because their life just sucks right now and so she writes a letter to her mom and they do the song California MIA which is it's very kind of punk rock not my favorite song of the musical but not a bad one and they I like that it starts out dear mom it's been real real bad very relatable and she's gonna take her sister and she's not giving the address and she doesn't want to because they've been living in a trailer broke uh, I love the sister, like, dancing to it. It's such just a good bit. Like, the scene picture is just so on point. Every detail is there, and it's amazing. Uh, the voices of Lex and Ethan together are so good. Just flawed. Amazing. And so stellar. It was mind-blowing how good this musical was. So then we go to the line that is formed outside of the, the toy zone and we meet Linda Monroe, who is the president of the Hatterfield Boating Society. She's a socialite, a self-proclaimed community leader, and she has arrived late, but her husband does rhinoplasties and she cuts the front by just paying people a bunch of money. And Becky Barnes, who is a nurse at a local hospital and is a couple spaces further back, it calls out Linda about this and they have a rivalry that was dating back into high school and Becky just kind of feels like the bribe should be illegal and they say and she's like oh Becky Barnes is an accountant called the police because it's just so dramatic and I love when Lauren plays characters like this just amazing and and she's going to buy to make matters where she cut in line and she's going to buy four wigglies which makes more scarcity Becky can't even turn the crowd against Linda and Linda kind of taunts Becky about how Becky's husband Stanley left her and that she doesn't blame Becky for being naive because she's so weak uh, and then Tom shows up and tries to buy Becky's spot in line and Becky is just trying to buy Wiggly for the pediatrics and Christmas um And Linda thinks that her children are better than Becky's children that she's buying for are needy. And Becky's like she's buying it for to give them hope so they don't die. But Linda doesn't care. Doesn't even care that she's giving it to children who have like lost their eyesight. And she was just like, you know, don't push your problems on this. And then when she realizes that it is Tom trying to buy ahead of her in line... And so then we do this number, What Do You Say?, which is so great. I love it so much. It's a great group number idea. The number is so funny. The choreography made it interesting. It's just incredible. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Amazing. I literally will rave about this musical whenever. Like, if you want to have a conversation outside of this podcast about how amazing this musical is, let me know because I'm down to talk about it because I love it so much. So then... Lex comes out and says everybody should form a single file line. Frank comes out and is super excited. He doesn't even like the dolls, but he does just like all of the people coming in. 
and buying and and then there's this like one creepy guy that's there we'll get to him in a minute played by the amazing girl who did jenny very talented and an amazing voice i didn't love the manager's song the music is a little too loud over his voice in this recording he does say this one line which i think is pretty interesting where it says kids send money for kids you buy kind of their love with money and they maybe love you maybe so then the very first customer, Sherman Young, the creepy guy, tries to buy all the Wigglies in the store before anyone else can. And Frank, of course, is going to accept the sale. Linda threatens to call her attorney because some people have been waiting forever, even though she got there late and bought her way to the front. But yeah, she still threatens to take her lawyer, Gary Goldstein, who is also in line. And then everybody's getting angry in the crowd. So Frank decides to set a policy that a customer can only buy one Wiggly apiece. Uh, most of the crowd is okay. But Linda is upset because she wanted to buy four Wigglies, each for her son. And Sherman is also mad because he wanted to buy all of them. And now has his plans taken away at the last minute because he's a pervert with a lot of plans for each Wiggly. I love that Sherman is like, you're going to be hearing from my attorney. And then the lawyer character pops up again. It's so funny. So, so funny. So then another customer steps in to start a bidding war and a bunch of people join in and Frank gets kind of blinded by greed and begins auctioning off Wigglies to the highest bidder which gets into the 300 and 400s which a lot of people can't afford but that's supply and demand Frank says so then one person who can't afford it is like just charges to the register and snatches the Wiggly and this leads to a huge riot everybody starts assaulting each other trying to grab the dolls they overpower frank and they take over the st store and begin rioting through the mall and they sing the song feast or famous which has this great hook of like you never should saddle you never should saddle and all of that oh so good so badass what beautiful chef's kiss to this um, just sincerely amazing oh my goodness so then ethan is trying to take hannah to santa claus to go to high school which is a wild movie that I honestly can't believe just only exists in this universe. But Ethan can't afford the expensive tickets, so he threatens the cashier that he is going to shove him in a locker and fart into it, aka the Easy Bake Oven. But he's interrupted by security, but that person gets called away to deal with the Toy Zone situation. And Ethan is like, sorry to Hannah that you didn't get into the movie. And he thinks that she's worried that they're fleeing to California. And Hannah is still unsettled because she just tells that from talking to Webby that it's going to get worse, basically, all of the stuff. And then, as if on cue, because Hannah is woke as heck, Ethan and Hannah are attacked by ramping customers. Ethan gets Hannah away and has her go hide. And he attempts to fight off the mob. But they overpower Ethan and they proceed to beat him for death and then realizing that they didn't have that he didn't have the doll on him and basically that it was for nothing. They just wasted time. Then Becky runs in with the doll and they attempt to rush her. But Tom swoops in to rescue her and chases them off and they find Ethan who mistakes Becky for Lex that and says that he's going to get her to California so that she doesn't have to cry so much anymore which is very moving but ethan is totally like a character from the outsider placed in here and it's just kind of amusing to me anyway becky wants tom to leave but tom doesn't want to give up on getting his son a wiggly the man in a hurry who he's called because he comes in and he enters to demand the wiggly because he's in a hurry which is very funny and Tom attempts to fight this guy, but unfortunately this guy has a knife, so he stabs Tom in the side, and Becky runs to help Tom, and the guy snatches the Wiggly from her and runs off. I love that Joe and Lauren are married, working together, it makes me so happy, or that they're going to get married, it just is amazing, I love it. So, poor Linda wasn't able to get hold of a Wiggly, but she is approached by Wilbur Cross, who is now not he's like this it's joey who's playing uncle willie and frank so at first as linda is with all people she's very aggressive and threatening towards him but wilbur convinces her to let her guard down because he's like he's gonna fulfill her actual desires which is that she wants to be adored conditionally by many people but not by like having to give anything to them so all linda has to do to get this is bring about the birth of a friend you win which is wiggly so wilbur opens linda's eyes to the true wiggly making her now a true worshiper because the wiggly is like a demonic force which i honestly love um so fun so creative 
amazing. Linda thinks that love is overrated, but she does come around that that is her. And she also realizes that two out of her four children are freaks. So then we see that she's getting crazy, to be honest, because there's a television podcast that informs that similar riots are happening in mobs all across America, like in all the malls, wherever you can get a wiggly, it's becoming a wiggly frenzy. It's getting so bad that President Howard Goodman has to declare a state of emergency and he holds a meeting with his senior staff to try to find a solution. The Secretary of Defense literally wants to, like, drone strike them. Riot shopper mania, which is very similar to <laughs> what happens in the end with Russia's idea. is very interesting. Not to spoil it, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So then there's, like, a Barack Obama character who's the VP. And he says that the shopper mania is spawned by this Tickly Wiggly doll. And he has one on hand. And the president is, like, very skeptical, but everybody in the room then falls under the sway of the Wiggly. And they start making threats against each other and their families to get a hold of the doll. They call, like, Harvard communities freaks. They're seeing it happen at, like, a natural level. The creepy Christmas score for this is so great for the scene. Just oh, amazing. I'm just in love. I'm in awe. It was so inspiring. That's what I want my musicals to make people feel, you know? So then the doll gets shot right out of the VP's hands to break the spell. And it is revealed to be General John McNamara of the U.S. Army and a special secret organization, P.I.P. Peep. It's a small team of just him and his peeps. Uh, very, very funny. And he's like, you can see the foul creatures work here. He explains that Peep is designed to fight against strange and supernatural situations such as this one and that he needs the president's help to fight back against an eldritch trying to make its way into our world. McNair convinces the president that he must become his best self now uh, in this beautiful song of monsters and men to fight the Wakeleys. Like, it's just amazing. He takes, like, a cigarette out of the doll. It's He's an, an amazing character, just so badass. And he says, we've got to come out of the blue into the black because there are monsters and there are men. And it's just... It's such a beautiful song, and it is, like, it's true, because it's, like, there are monsters, and then there are men. And he says he wants them to, like, step into the black and white. And I kind of hate the phrasing of the term black and white. That's not necessarily his fault. It makes sense for the sun, but it's, like, it feels like it's race. It's, like, rooted in racism, right? Because it's, like, I feel like shaming, even though I know, like, words have, like, English language, but I don't know. I want to be, like, conscious of things. But regardless of that, I think that the song is very touching. It's about aligning your morals. And they're like, you know, it is the monsters that should live in dread. And you have to just try your best. But that monsters and there are men, it's just such a great, great line. And then that's the end of the first act. What a way to go. It's simply amazing. And then we open up on Santa Claus is going to high school in which Santa Claus has disguised himself as a teenage basketball star, Chris Kringle, and he has to hide his identity from Noelle, who is a popular girl and the love interest. You know, he just, but he doesn't want to screw up on Christmas and he's in high school. I love the dance. And then Tom wakes up and is like, what the fuck am I watching? Uh, which makes sense, but honestly, I can't also believe this movie has not been made. Becky brought him into the movie theater to help patch up his knife wound away from the mob. Uh, luckily, the knife wound missed the vital organs. I also love that this movie was just like Santa is reconnecting with his youth because he's out of touch of the kids of the world. Like, it's just, it's so amazing. Becky opens up and says that her... Husband didn't let her go to movies and they reconnect and they realize that they're in the same seats they used to, which is just like force of habit, I guess. There's things that you did in high school that are just like ingrained in your brain sometimes. And it's in the same seats that they used to when they used to go to date and they reveal like the penis that they carved under them is still there. And they recollect on their time together because they used to date, but they grew apart once Tom was deployed overseas. Becky tries to convince Tom to leave the store, saying that there's no dolls left, even though other shoppers are organizing to find them anyway. Tom doesn't want to, and he snaps at her when she tries to stop him from leaving to look for a doll. And Tom reveals that he was driving in the car crash where his wife died and that he blames himself. 
and he feels that he has to get this Wrigley to fix his relationship with his son Tim and and then Becky responds and reveals that her husband Stanley didn't run out on her she reveals that she really wanted to go to Tom's wife funeral and was stopped by her husband which made her snap and then lash out and then he got violent and chased her out of the house and into the woods with a knife and Becky ended up getting the knife and stabbing her husband in and leaving him bleeding out and she doesn't know if he was for sure dead but she hopes that he is and she says it in this like beautiful line it was like you're sad you killed your wife well I'm I hope I killed my husband like I hope I killed mine and it's just uh so so powerful I mean not that I could to do all of that but I I love it it's just so on edge and edgy and very real when you're in an abusive relationship i think those feelings that she that she reveals is just so so real this this musical is raw and amazing and just very very honest and tom consoles her and then says that she's just she looks just the same as she did in high school which is very nice and oh this song it's one of my favorite musical theater songs ever maybe my favorite duets where it's like take me back in time to love you take me back when things were light lost in none it's so so good you guys i mean just oh so amazing it's so amazing just i love that too that yeah i i it's it's a song that i wish i wrote in jest and it definitely influenced like hardcore please don't sue me for this like understand that i'm another artist and it's definitely a different song to a different beat but in Jess, the musical I'm writing about my animated lesbian princess and jester, Godina sings the song. She's that's the princess's name, Godina, and she sings the song to Jocelyn when they when she kind of realizes that they can't be together and it's very much inspired. But that hook is this only works in a distant time, but it's like similar to the to the thing of time. It just like it super inspired me, the song. But uh that take me back in time to love you. It's so good. Like what the that phrase, like it's so beautiful. And I feel like I felt that in every single relationship that I've loved of like wanting to have loved this person earlier and wanting to like go back to times where you could just be with that person and I also love that you you could find love in this horrible horrible event and it can still feel like that like oh it's just the heart of a great musical is this this killer love story and that they're different people than they were in high school but they still circle back and I don't know I'm always just a just a little whore for all of that stuff I'll be honest and so Then they fuck in the movie theater and Tom is like, he declares that Santa Claus is going to high school is the best movie ever. You know, sometimes all any movie is, is just the personal experience of it. And it's just, I just love it. Oh, such a good number. I mean, I mean, just like simply amazing. I feel like it's underrated. I feel like that number should have won a Grammy and it's just beautifully sung. I just, I love it. Okay. I can talk for, I can talk for a pot i could probably talk for a season alone on how much i love that song i'm just gonna be real i it, that doesn't happen for me very often so anyway we're going back to general McInera and his peeps uh he takes the presidents to his headquarters and he introduces them to the other scientists and he reveals that there are many different dimensions but beyond all of them is a void swirling with psychic energy that peep is dubbed the black and white so they discovered wiggly 13 years prior when an ex peep agent wilbur cross who as you know is the one talking to linda crossed the black and white via portal that they constructed according to mcanera cross came back a lunatic who pledged his undying loyalty to wiggly before disappearing becoming wiggly's agent in our reality and wiggly basically wants to come through to their reality to rule it like his own and McNara wants to send the president in to negotiate a peace deal basically sit down with the devil and the president absolutely does not want to do that he is a bit of a scaredy he does not want to stop the birth of a god and the president feels like you know this was definitely not on his bucket list anyway back at the mall the customers who were empty-handed who were unable to get a wiggly doll have taken over the mall and formed this cult wiggly And they believe that if they worship Wiggly and do Wiggly's bidding, they'll be rewarded with a doll of their own. 
Wiggly's prophet is Linda, and they have captured Frank and Lex, who they believe to have hidden a doll somewhere in the mall. It is, like, wild that it people can get brainwashed like that, and it is, it's such a, like, interesting perspective on religion in this musical that I really like. They are gonna, like, set fire to sacrifice the Cinnabon. I love that Linda weirdly feels like a Kim Kardashian impression, and low-key, low-key, I think Kim Kardashian could be the antichrist and i say that with respect and fear i also love this line where it's like i met god and i had nothing nice to say oh so good honestly just some peak writing peak writing so linda reveals that in order to bring wiggly through she needs the doll to act as like a vessel for his essence she still really wants four of them frank begs for his life and offers to get them a doll from the manufacturer but he doesn't know about hand in the backpack and he ends up getting killed by Linda, Lex still refuses to cooperate, even though her boss just got killed, uh, even though she's got her sister out there. Rebel to the end, baby. But the security guard, who is also now under the thrall of Wiggly, reveals that there was footage of Lex putting the doll in Hannah's backpack. And Linda sends her followers to find Hannah, and she laps up the attention and affection that the cult gives her and adore me and there is like so much lady gaga in this and i like that that's like people don't want to think for themselves and she says that she knows what they want and that they're tired of just like receiving crap essentially and then hannah is seeing this like devilish version of ethan from the black and white who at first is very calm and comforting but then hannah realizes that he's being controlled by wiggly and he turns angry and aggressive And Hannah then stops speaking to Wiggly and talks to the doll and isn't going to give in to it, even though Wiggly is trying to tell Hannah to be pals with him. And Hannah's like, you're trying to trick me. Like, Webby told me all about you. And Wiggly calls Webby a stupid bitch. Uh, Not a way to win out. And he calls Hannah banana and says that he's going to split her in two and eat her which is just awful Ugh, so gross nasty little thing something marcy probably would love i feel really bad for hannah then tom and becky see hannah with the wiggly and they're under wiggly spell and they say things that grown-ups don't get tricked even though that's like the adam and eve story but all right and they take on a predatory nature as hannah flees tom remarks that tim is about hannah's age and that he'd do anything for them And Tom is all mad that Hannah gets away running from them because they're being creepy and trying to stalk her. And Becky says, you know, don't scream. It frightens them. You have to lure them delicately, put them to sleep. And she has this like sedative. It's such a Mrs. Lovett vibe, but it's amazing. It's something I love to see. Love it for a reason. You know, it's super creepy. I feel like when this song of like, do you want to play with me? lovely girl lovely girl i feel like this is me to my pets honestly even though it's so creepy but that's not i'm not trying to necessarily do exactly what they're doing but i love this song super creepy but i just it's amazing tom is able to grab hannah but becky fails to inject hannah with the sedative and puts it in her own leg instead and overcome of the medicine falls on top of hannah pinning her to the ground which is really scary so then tom gets the doll lets uh becky have her nap then becky and hannah are kidnapped they are going to bring both the women to the blood which is very messed up i love this one line where they're like i can't be evil i'm a status quo democrat which is just very very funny so the president enters the black and white and he comes across wilbur cross cross doesn't want to give him a face to face with wiggly cross toys with him and says he says that wiggly use the doll as a vessel because consumerism and products are the only things left that people actually believe in which is i think sad to an impact and mcnara lost radio contact with the president so he rushes in the portal to try to get him out cross continues to mock the president claiming that the american consumer communist culture and the shitty state of affairs the country is in is what made it fertile ground for wiggly to launch his attack only in america can wiggly take root 
essentially. Because in the Netherlands, they have free health care and they're not worried about it. And yeah, it makes sense. Like when life is working out, you don't have to worry about it. And this is such a thing of like how dangerous human beings can be. Like the things that we influence every day that we don't think about because you just get mindful and doing things and you don't question things in society and how impactful your life can be. So then we meet Wiggly, who is portrayed as just like tentacles and two giant lights for eyes. He's frightening though still. And the president tries to stand up to Wiggly, but he just laughs and is going to eat him. But Mechanaric steps in with the sword of truth. Mechanera sends the president back to the portal, but he can't leave with him because he entered the black and white without a suit and now has become part of the psychic energy of the portal. A very, very sad death. And Wiggly was also going to have a Christmas birthday. How interesting is that? Just freaky the way it all breaked apart and the president is all sad because he messed it up and he's really sorry. Horror movies are always involving dolls and I wonder what that is if it's like just the dolls are naturally creepy or there's something really to that or it's like the emptiness of a human I have no idea but it's rough it's rough so then the president gets back to the dimension and says hey this hydrogen bomb has to be deployed but they don't have it it seems like the bomb is misplaced and they don't hear it go off and it is revealed the Russians had their own portal and that Wiggly set the bomb through to Moscow instead where it destroyed Russia's capital, which was Wiggly's plan from the very beginning. So making more war on America with Russia just because they like tricked them. And the president is just really, really messed up about that as like, as I am even thinking about the situation that that would bring on. He didn't know that there were two doors instead of just one. And Wiggly is just like, you know, Thank you for visiting my home. I can't wait to visit yours. And it's so, so creepy. So Sherman, the creepy guy who was trying to buy all the dolls, he's full in the cult and he brings back Lexi to sacrifice her to Wiggly. Lex begs for freedom and almost convinces Sherman to let her go because she promises that he, she has like a one of a kind misprint of pony and that then Sherman could murder her later. She'd just have to get it out because she said she threw it in the trash. Even though the messy colors are more valuable, they're like collective animals. And so she is going to get killed for that because of the way that she treated that pony. And then I love this song where it's like, is this what I live for? To be choked in a toy store, staring into hell, awake for my funeral. It's so, so good. Oh, so good. Where she sings Black Friday. It's just amazing. And she is just sad that she can't help her sister. And so she's just being choked to death by Sherman, who's mad that he was going to be lied to. And she does this whole thing where she's like, says she comments on how she lived in mortal poverty. And I just, I felt that. I felt that mortal poverty. And she was an angel or heaven sent. It's just, it's a heartbreaking song. And she'll go like, Friday's black for me. Dreamer, dream the dream. And I could honestly see this role. This role has a totally different impact as like a woman of color playing this part. Like I want to see that casting because it's going to be amazing. And she reflects, you know, on all, when did half-baked sympathy save those in need? And her sis, she's going to leave her sister on her own and it's breaking her heart. And I just definitely like feel this. But then Macamara appears and he says, you know what? You're not dead yet and I'm going to help you through this. And I just, I fucking love this. I like want to cry. It's so amazing. And he says he's authorizing her to use this gun and he's going to power her that she can manifest that weapon into reality. It's so, the scene is so wild and so well done. I love it. And then he sings the song where it's like, he reprises basically Monsters and Men where it's like, you got to be your best self now. And I just, oh, I love it. He's like, I can show you the path, but only you can walk it. Oh, the lyrics, they're so good, you guys. You don't even know. You gotta watch it. Just watch it and let's make this musical happen again. And it's it's gonna be amazing. Uh, just so good. And so then she gets the gun, which she, Sherman is like, where did that come from? And so she shoots Sherman, though, and she escapes. And basically, she's not through yet, and she is called to serve. Wiggly can be defeated anywhere, and that she needs to gather forces. She has to wake the warrior trapped in a deep sleep, who is Tom, kill the prophet, and save the world. So Lexi finds Tom before he's about to leave, 
and she just tells him to drop the doll and come help her. But Tom thinks that he she only wants the doll for herself. And Lex is able to get through to Tom because she points out that Tim didn't want the doll. He is never... Because Tom is like, no, he wants this more than anything. And Lexi's like, did he ever say that he wanted it? And Tim is, and Tom is like, wait, he must have. She was like, I'm 16. She's like, I've been 16. I know what kids like and what kids didn't ask for. And she points out that Tim doesn't want the doll because no child actually likes the toy. Wiggly's only wanted by adults who believe that he can fill whatever void is missing in their life. I also love the line where it's like, kids don't want this doll. They're all into Fortnite, dude. It's so amazing. And it's just so powerful to be like, you're trying to make this up for you and not your son. And I feel like a lot of parents need to to wake up and realize this lesson. And Tom recalls back that he realizes that Tim never said that he wanted a Wiggly. And he thinks about when he was shopping with his father and he didn't get this toy gun he wanted. But he didn't care because... All that mattered was that he was being with his father, spending time with that. And he realizes that, and Lexi point, and Lex points out, she's like, I get it, dude, 40, you're 40, your life is over, which is very funny. But what she's saying is just like very relatable. And Tom wakes up and realizes the answer is not him. And he goes, I submit uh, this beautiful song of if I fail you one more time. And I love it. I just love the... The hell I've been thinking, my heart is so empty, everyone's dying, and me too. It's just so beautiful. And in Dylan's voice, mwah, mwah. And though he was gone long before you, oh, there's just beautiful poetry in this song. I want to cry all the time. And he realizes that it wasn't the thing that he wanted. Tom didn't even know what he wanted. He just really wanted his basic needs and to get through the next day. And it's just, oh, it was so really emotional, which a lot of them are now. And so he kind of takes the power away and then he just realizes that this doll's not cute at all. It's really fucking ugly. So he tosses the doll aside and he agrees to go with Lex to save Hannah and Becky. Tom also knows guns, which is a good thing to have on her side. He realizes that Lex is holding the gun long. I love that. I love this like good cult movie of America. Like, I mean, it's just, it's brilliant. So Linda goes to mock Becky, but then she's knocked out still by the sedative. So she doesn't feel like it's not any fun. And so she makes the cult just carry them away. And then she's also disappointed because she opens the backpack and doesn't find a doll. So she threatens Hannah with a knife. But then Lexi comes to the doll, even though she's going into this lion's den outnumbered. And poor Hannah is thinking that, you know, like, I have this magic hat that her Lex's boyfriend gave and is like, nothing can hurt me. And Linda says that, you know, only Wiggly's magic will matter. There's also like a Meryl Streep vibe to this Linda character that I really like. But Lexi has this upper hand because she arrives with the doll and she uses the doll's hold in the cult to distract them so that Tom can sneak up with Linda with a gun. Lexi threatens to burn the doll, which causes Linda to just freak out and scream the whole time because there are plans that were made out for her. They're planning to do war and send people overseas. And here Lexi and Tom are risking their life. So Lexi threatens to burn the doll and she causes Linda to freak out screaming, but she overpowers Tom and she takes the doll from Lexi. And she believes that she's won and Linda leads the cult in a worship of Wiggly and they're planning to do war send people overseas you're gonna risk your life in your own way to provide entertainment they're forced to like this west side story life but I I weirdly like love it all so they prepare to create this portal for Wiggly but then our little killer Becky lines up her shot that's what she says and she kills the prophet and the lawyer is like we're gonna have to talk about that and they say all this thing of like oh you gotta abandon your god or you're gonna burn with him and Lex grabs the doll as the court is burning and she lights it on fire and the cultists all grab hold of the gall catching fire as they do and the whole mall ends up being a blazing they just commit arson slightly but so they did like commit arson which is not ideal but a little bit intense and maybe all these people could have been saved given a little more time in their grief of the god that they believed in but the fire spread fast and so the mall's coming down which is good and then tom becky and lex and hannah all escape the burning mall to the road outside of it this is actually in michigan in northville is where it's based because they're all from michigan or at least went to the state of the university of michigan and they're met by paul and emma in a station wagon with tim and paul 
says, you know, that there is a bombing of Moscow, that it's going to be World War Three, like the uh, whole world is in this like nuclear war. And they were trying to get out of town, but Tim wouldn't let them go without him. And Tom says, like, when all of this is over, they really want to talk about Jane. And Emma says that she knows this kooky reclusive biology professor who is in the guy who didn't like musicals apparently which i'm going to rouch right after this because apparently it's important if it's referenced so much but that guy's a panic room and they might be safe there so they plan to drive there and tom notes that hey it's midnight which means black friday is almost over and if they can survive today they can survive anything hannah's voice is absolutely beautiful i love the what if tomorrow comes today it's so beautiful and breaks the dawn oh just beautiful it gets stuck in my head all the time this musical is so gorgeous but yeah she sings about her fears and uncertainty in what's to come fears that are shared by like everyone in the town <laughs> even everyone now and they count on the final seconds of black friday and a plane is heard flying overhead which i think was like bombed which i guessing they were bombed by russia but we don't know its purpose or destination because it ends. <laughs> and this musical happened, like, right around when, like, a lot of people got sick. And I guess they even ha ended up canceling one night and just doing, like, a cabaret of things because so many people got sick. And I wondered if it was, like, kind of from the pandemic because it's right in that time. It's, like, right, right in that sweet spot. But, yeah, I love this so much. Obviously... I mean, I think a 13-year-old could handle some of the subject matter in this, depending on, like, who your 13-year-old is, but I think it's definitely, I think it is something that children should watch, because I think it's, it's just simply, it's so good. It's, it really just is. It's just fantastically beautiful, written, like, they should be proud. They should be so proud, because it was a work of art. It was one of the best works of art I've seen. It's definitely, I think, their best musical to date. Just really well crafted. Sometimes I think I love a lot of their spoof ones, but they can all just go on a little too long, and it's this one, so, so good. And so many profound messages. Like I said, I could talk for three hours. I managed to talk for about one, so there's that. I'm, I did better than I expected because I really could have gone with this for two hours, but if you haven't seen Black Friday, just see it. And yeah, let me know what you think about it. Would love to talk about this musical. Would love to put on this musical. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you for listening. I would It would mean so much if you could follow my socials. Uh, if you have some money to donate, that would also be amazing. I make still zero dollars from this, but I would love to make money to so I can pay more people and get the word out and do more cool things and be able to properly take care of my health. So yeah, I appreciate you all so much for listening. Follow me on socials. Feel free to have more discussions about me with this movie. I love this musical so much. I plan to sing some of the songs, so it will be amazing. And I'm so grateful for y'all listening. And I'm so grateful that it was made. I love Star Kid. I saw them once live and it was absolutely worth it. Wishing all the best and see you on the next episode. Is, is this really for kids?